Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again, Joe and Lai Part 6. Let's get right on it. Part 5 ended with Joe and Lai's return to Beijing after a historically good performance at the Geneva Conference, April 26th to July 20th, 1954. Joe and Lai sure made China look good in front of the Americans, British, and French. He made the most of his time to try and create some semblance of a diplomatic relationship with these Western allies. With the case of the United States, he walked away from the conference quite pleased with himself. Although official relations would have to wait until Deng Xiaoping's time, January 1979, President Jimmy Carter, Joe made the most of the opportunity in Geneva. He had created backdoor channels to keep an unofficial dialogue going with the United States, which was better than nothing. With the country only formally established in October 1949, Joe and Lai had his hands full trying to get the framework put in place to manage a government. He quietly did this and groomed a lot of people along the way in the foreign ministry especially and in other ministries under the state council. This was a tall order to lead this effort to lift China up from the ruins, going back to the opium war practically, and get a working government in place to handle the needs of 540 million people, most of them poor and living in rural areas. China's per capita income was about half of India's. That wasn't uh, some nine-to-five job. Joe and I had to juggle a lot of balls and wear a hundred hats to get it done. And then so early in the history of the PRC, the Korean War happened. Mao put Joe in charge, so he had to deal with that as well. The Korean War later on leads to the Geneva Conference, and now here we are today in Part 6. You'd think Joe already had his hands full and that any further responsibility would be the proverbial straw. Well, remember Mao Zedong? Joe also had to deal with him, too. Mao had a lot of big ideas about what he wanted to do now that he was in the driver's seat. Two big things on his mind were land reform and weeding out the last of the counter-revolutionaries who managed to slip through the Yan'an rectification campaign. Right as Mao was doing this came the Gaogang affair. Gao was a Shanxi communist from as far back as 1926. He was a peasant, not very literate, but very capable and filled with ambition. The main thing he was remembered for, aside from this affair that bears his name, was handing Yan'an over to Mao at the end of the Long March. Gao was instrumental in getting that base set up, and it's at that base where Mao decided he'd stay after the Long March, at least until 1947. Those two hit it off, and there was no question of Gao's loyalty to Mao. When the showdown with Wang Ming happened, Gao supported Mao. The problem really began in July 1949 when Mao sent Gao Gang to Russia, and during that time, Gao became very close with the Soviets, suspiciously close. That's when talk began to get around the party inner circles, inferring Gao was getting a, just a little bit too cozy with the Soviets. Nothing came of it for a while. Gao wasn't a very sophisticated or politically savvy fella. He didn't, he didn't know how to keep his trap shut, and he misjudged where he stood with the capricious Chairman Mao. While Zhou Enlai was in the trenches pouring the foundation for the new state council, dealing with the Korean War, doing all the heavy lifting with regard to PRC diplomacy, and co-managing the first five-year plan, he also had to deal with the Gao Gang affair. Gao, to make a long story short, was the top political and economic leader in the Northeast. He was the king of Manchuria, and being in charge of such a place as that, he had plenty of dealings with the Soviets. Russia always coveted Manchuria, going back to the time of the Tsars. In 1953, they were still there, as entrenched as ever. Zhou Enlai though the economy was not his greatest strength, was tasked by Mao to spearhead the first five-year plan. As you recall, the Korean War was Zhou's last military assignment. And after that, Mao passed this CMC leadership job to Peng Dehuai. That was a big load off Zhou, no doubt. So Zhou took charge of this 
first five-year plan. And in August 1952, he personally, with Chen Yun, Li Fu Chun, and others, went to Moscow to go cap in hand to Stalin to see how much of China's wish list he was going to fund. On August 20th, Joe sat across the table from Stalin. The great Russian leader would be dead in seven months, but he was still very much alive and very much intimidating. Unlike Joe, who was not an economics and finance guy, Stalin was. And he couldn't scoff enough at the plan Joe presented. He found fault with every request and statistic, and I'm sure even Premier Joe had to be squirming in his seat. Joe's wish list had 151 projects listed. No question about it, Joe had to face down Stalin and say this was what China needed. And as I said, Joseph Stalin was not making this easy for China's premier. I mean, think about that in today's context. Can you imagine in a thousand years Li Keqiang going to Vladimir Putin and trying to get him to fund some infrastructure projects in China? And of course, Joe reminded Stalin that while he stood behind the curtain during the Korean War, like the Wizard of Oz, it was China who had to face American bombs and bullets. It was Chinese soldiers who got decimated on the battlefield and in the hundreds of thousands and froze to death in the Korean winter. China took the entirety of the bad rap from the Korean War and was just short of an international pariah because of it. So in a way... It was payback time, and for Stalin to reconsider his way of looking at the whole thing. When they shook hands, the USSR, that is Stalin, had okayed funding for 150 of these projects on China's wish list. The first five-year plan pretty much emulated the Soviet model. And it was during this period that followed, all the way up to the Sino-Soviet split, that China was crawling with Soviet engineers and apparatchiks working on all these massive heavy industrial projects all over China, but mostly in the Northeast, Gaogang territory. Soviet influence in China was at its peak by this point. They already should have evacuated Port Arthur, Lu Xunko, or in uh, Liaoning. As part of the deal worked out, Russia got to stay there a little bit longer. And with that... September 22, 1952, Zhou headed back to Beijing, leaving the task of working out the details to Li Fu Chun and his staff. No sooner had Zhou returned, after getting the whole five-year plan done, Mao went and took China's economy away from his portfolio of responsibilities. This left Zhou to focus on the country's administration and foreign policy. Not a small job. But the way things work in China today and back then, too, when all of a sudden the top leader starts stripping away all your leadership positions, it always pretends a fall from grace. Any China watcher would reasonably conclude, poor old Zhou Enlai, his star was falling. Gee, what could he have done? Everyone knew the Soviets loved Gao Gang. Stalin had even once lauded him as a true internationalist. So when word got back to Mao that Gao Gang was shooting his mouth off in front of his Soviet chums and cozying up to them in an inappropriate manner and even revealing very sensitive party info, smoke started coming out of the chairman's ears. In a style that would become all too familiar later on, Mao had supposedly told Gao casually that, you know, he was dissatisfied with Zhou Enlai and Liu Shaoqi and they weren't doing their jobs well and Liu was a foot-dragger when it came to carrying out what Mao wanted. Now, after the Gao Gang affair, not too many people ever made this mistake again. But Gao took this to mean that Mao was giving him the go-ahead to get rid of Zhou and Liu. And this is exactly what Gao Gang started trying to do. Behind the scenes, one-on-one -on -one lobbying with key party leaders, not being terribly discreet, he went right at Liu Shaoqi and tried to bring him down. Now, at this time in the CCP pecking order... Mao was, of course, ranked first, Liu second, Zhou Enlai third, Zhu De fourth, Chen Yun fifth, and Gao Gang was sixth in the Politburo. Not in the top five, but not a lightweight either. Now, as a sidebar to all this, Mao wasn't terribly happy with Liu Shaoqi in 1952-53, so his manipulation of Gao Gang had the additional objective to scare Liu Shaoqi into shape and show him, don't piss off Chairman Mao, nor take his words lightly. 
Leo had done a few things that hadn't made Mao happy. So Mao allowed Gao to savage Liu Shaoqi and put the fear of God into him, so to speak. By late 1953, though, Mao decided to put an end to this game he was playing. Liu Shaoqi had been properly frightened into line, and Mao knew Zhou wasn't going to push back on anything. The thing that triggered Mao's decision to whack Gao Gang came about after Deng Xiaoping and Chen Yun went to Mao and told on Gao Gang. They informed Mao everything Gao was trying to do behind the scenes and what he was saying to them and to other top party officials that Liu had to go and Zhou should step aside for some new blood to take over and basically doing the unthinkable, attempting to split the party. So Deng and Chen, right around Christmas time, 1953, suggested to Mao that something needed to be done in this case. Mao's decision was to pick up and head down to beautiful Hangzhou to hang out on the shores of Westlake in a sumptuous villa. But before he left in December, Mao attended a meeting and called Gao Gang out for his anti-party alliance and for setting up a second headquarters in Beijing that rivaled the current headquarters that had Mao at the helm. He was too close and too indiscreet with the Soviets, and he was trying to split the party, and he was unashamedly setting up his own little kingdom up in Manchuria, a la Zhang Zolin. That was about as final and irrevocable of a political death sentence as one could possibly get back in 1953-54 China. Mao had made the decision that Gao Gang had to go. So after banging the gavel and heading down to idyllic Hangzhou, Mao put Liu Shaoqi in charge of the party. Then anyone who doubted whether or not Liu was still number two in the standings had yeah, that question answered. This was one sudden and violent reversal of fortune for Gao Gang. One minute he thought he had Chairman Mao on his side. The next minute he found the chairman had cut him loose. And now Zhou Enlai, who Gao had tried to push aside was put in charge of prosecuting him. Gao Gang met his fate at the fourth plenum of the Seventh Central Committee. In the end, it was left to Zhou Enlai to deconstruct Gao Gang before everyone. He did it with so much gusto that it drove Gao to two suicide attempts on February 17, 1954, and six months later in August. He succeeded on the second attempt. And as for Premier Zhou... He was still ranked number three, and the economy was reorganized under an organ known as the State Planning Commission. And this was headed by a Zhou man going back to the Paris days, Li Fu Chun. And to show Zhou was back in Mao's good graces, the State Planning Commission was put back under Zhou's side of the org chart. Besides Li Fu Chun at the State Planning Commission, yet Chen Yun in charge of the State Finance Commission and Bo Yi Bo heading the State Economic Commission all reported to Zhou. All this time, while the Gao Gang affair was going on, Zhou was dealing with the aftermath of the Korean War. So when he was locked up in a room, ripping Gao Gang to shreds in front of those Gao had sought to replace, he was only two months away from the Geneva Conference. Never a dull moment with Premier Zhou. So the upshot to all this was that Mao yanked Liu Shaoqi back in a line, got the word out to everyone not to talk to the Soviets or get too cozy with them, don't mess with party unity, and most of all, remember who was in charge, or else you'll be the next Gao Gang. This was the first, but of course, not the last major high-level purge in PRC history. Now, I didn't mention Gao had an accomplice to all this named Rao Shushi. Rao was to Shanghai what Gao was to Manchuria. Rao, too, got severely reprimanded for his role in siding with Gao and spent the next 20 years in prison, dying there in 1975. This whole matter is also known as the Gao Rao Affair, or the Gao Rao Fan Dang Lian Meng. Let's just touch also on the San Fan and Wu Fan campaigns. These started off towards the waning days of 1951. Zhou Enlai had his hands full with the Korean War at this time, but Mao decided he wanted to start going after certain elements of Chinese society. This presented quite a headache to Zhou Enlai. As I've mentioned a few times going back to the earliest days, Zhou had always been a proponent of building bridges with those who were not dedicated communists including industrialists, many intellectuals, and, of course, capitalists. 
Zhou had been the voice of reason, convincing this element of Chinese society, going back to even before the Chongqing years, to keep an open mind about the communists and China's future. He had spent years cultivating many of these relationships personally. Well, with the three ante and especially the five ante campaign, a lot of these people will ask themselves why they were so naive to listen to Zhou Enlai. The Sanfan, or three antis, were corruption, waste, and bureaucracy. Yeah, Tan Wu He Lang Fei Shi Ji Da Da Fan Zui. That was a nice rhyming couplet from Mao. Corruption and waste were the biggest crimes. Now, this campaign almost entirely targeted party members, mostly in the urban areas. The ones targeted, of course, were those whose loyalty to Mao was most in question. This is where anyone, for example, from the KMT who switched sides and stayed behind, this is where they got it. Ironically, it was Gao Gang who launched the campaign in his stronghold of Manchuria before it was rolled out nationally. The Five Antis campaign started later but ran alongside the Three Antis. This is the one where the capitalists and the bourgeoisie got it. The circumference of the umbrella that made up the Five Antis was broad enough whereby any Jishifunza or Tsubanjuija could be rounded up and persecuted. The five antis were bribery, theft of state property, tax evasion, cheating on government contracts, and stealing state economic information. Anyone with a shingle hanging in front of somewhere was suspect. Yeah, 1952, it was a bad year for capitalism in the PRC. And if you had a beef with your boss, opportunity knocked. A lot of payback and retribution was meted out during the five antis. Joe, perhaps, did what he could to save people here and there. But for the most part, many of these people who he had convinced to remain behind and give the PRC a chance were ruined during this campaign. So land reform pretty much did away with the rural gentry who had it so good for pretty much all of Chinese history, going back to the Shang Dynasty. Next up were the bourgeoisie, who had stayed behind, helped get commerce and industry back up and running. Then when everything was okay, by 1952, 1953, they had outlived their usefulness, and so they too had to take that walk of shame. Premier Zhou had to look the other way. Nothing he can do. Mao wasn't so sure the bourgeoisie were on his side, so this was the time he chose to eliminate that threat. So let's finally get to the Bandung Conference. If the Geneva Conference was Zhou Enlai's big debut to the Western powers, the Bandung Conference was his inaugural meeting with the powers that be in his own backyard, as well as in Africa. The Asian-African Conference took place in Bandung, Indonesia, between April 18th and 24th, 1955. Sukarno hosted this event. 29 countries participated, and it was announced the previous December. The upshot of the Bandung Conference was a 10-point declaration that essentially incorporated the five principles of peaceful coexistence that Zhou Enlai and Nehru had agreed to just recently. We looked at that in the last episode. Zhou had a lot riding on this meeting. All these nations may have had a lot in common with respect to their colonial and imperialist past, that is, being on the wrong end of those two systems. But it was a decidedly non-China-friendly crowd. So into this lion's den, Zhou Enlai went. He figured this was going to be a golden opportunity to reach out to all these non-aligned nations. Not on Russia's side, not on America's side either. This made them all potential China friends. When it came time for Zhou to fly out to Bandung to attend, there was an attempt to snuff him out. Good old CAAC, Zhongguo Minhang, they didn't have the wherewithal yet to transport Joe and his team to Jakarta, so Nehru kindly offered an Air India plane to Joe and the Chinese delegation, and this plane was called the Kashmir Princess. A few hours after it flew out of Hong Kong's Kai Tak Airport, around 7 p.m., cruising at an altitude of 17,000 feet, it exploded. Someone had stuck a time bomb in the wheel housing and it brought the plane down. But Joe wasn't on the flight. He had been tipped off about what was coming. Only three crew members survived. Everyone else, 16 people in all, were killed. The Kashmir Princess's air plan called for the flight to go from Hong Kong to Jakarta on April 11, 1955. 
The Chinese delegation would travel on this plane, including Zhou Enlai and Chen Yi. Word had gotten to Zhou that KMT operatives at Kai Tak Airport were planning to sabotage his plane. At the last minute, Zhou and Chen Yi got off, and the rest of the delegation went ahead. These were not high-ranking staff, and Zhou made the call to sacrifice all 16 of them for the sake of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture was the future cooperation Zhou ended up getting from the British authorities in Hong Kong in closing down this KMT spy network operating in the colony. From this incident, it led to other areas of behind-the-scenes cooperation between Britain and China. The other thing was the sympathy Joe garnered from those attending the conference. As I said, it wasn't a hostile crowd that Joe was going to face, but it certainly wasn't friendly. The assassination attempt on his life contributed to loosening things up a bit for China's premier come foreign minister. It said the Americans were in cahoots with the KMT spooks that messed with the uh, Kashmir princess. There seemed to be some evidence and even an admission later on by a retired U.S. intel officer who said the CIA was involved in the incident. When Kissinger met Zhou Enlai back in 1971 when he was doing the advance work for the upcoming Nixon visit, Joe asked Kissinger if the Americans had tried to bump him off in April of 1955. Kissinger supposedly replied, quote, Mr. Premier... You greatly overestimate the competence of the CIA, end quote. Joe did quite a bit at this conference to calm the waters and build some bridges where the strongest animosity had previously existed. Many of the representatives started hating on China as soon as Joe settled down in his chair. In no time at all, things had degraded to the point where this discussion of a non-aligned movement turned into an anti-communist ranting forum A lot of voices were saying the communist alternative that China was preaching everywhere was no better or worse than what the imperialists and colonialists had to offer. By 1955, when this Bandung conference was going on, the chamber of horrors that went on under Stalin and the Soviet Union was no secret. The dreaded, ugly side of communism had reared its ugly head already, and it wasn't so easy for Zhou to discard this mantle that was being placed on him. Our ally, we could always count on them, the Republic of the Philippines, even went so far as to attack China, not by name, of course, but by using the more diplomatically tactful term, certain countries, who were trying too hard to emulate the Soviet ways. So Zhou had to answer to all this at Bandung. And of course, remember going back to the mid 19th century, the Chinese diaspora had already spread out far and wide all over the world and were citizens for many generations in all the countries of Southeast Asia. The representatives of these nations groused at Zhou saying China was stirring these people up and causing unwanted revolution in their respective countries. The Thai prince who attended the Bandung conference downright pointed a finger at Zhou and accused him meaning China, of arming anti-government rebels along the Thai-Yunnan border. Mao had been a big proponent of supporting revolution elsewhere, so Zhou, as usual, whenever Mao was concerned, had to tread very carefully. After a while, it became clear to Zhou that things weren't working out like he expected. In the face of all these accusations, Zhou had to throw away the playbook and make something up on the fly. His speech that he intended to give was printed and distributed. Then he gave another speech, and in this convincing, impromptu performance, he managed to sway all but the most virulent of American allies. He made it clear China had its own problems and had no intentions of interfering in any other country's affairs. They would not support any communist movements or attempt to exert any influence over the local overseas Chinese who call these Southeast Asian nations home. The sticking point for many, well, Indonesia especially, was the principle of eusanguinis. This is a Latin word meaning right of blood. It went back to the final years of the Qing dynasty, 1909, and said if you were ethnic Chinese born and bred in... Jakarta, for example, you still had, as far as China was concerned, right to become a Chinese citizen. This whole thing implied that 
There were dual loyalties. And as far as this state of affairs existed, who could possibly trust their ethnic Chinese citizens? Zhou signed a treaty that settled that matter for the time being. Once Sukarno was overthrown in 1965 in a communist coup, the era of living dangerously, that will usher in a new chapter for overseas Chinese there. But for the time being, in 1955, and when the treaty was ratified in 1957, the issue was put to an uneasy slumber as far as where the political loyalties of the overseas Chinese rested. Plenty of overseas Chinese are not going to be happy about losing this right that Zhou Enlai took away from them. Meanwhile, back in the homeland, in Zhongnanhai in particular, things weren't so tranquil. The main reason was that Mao wasn't happy with the slow pace of rural collectivization. This was the period when he uttered the famous words that his colleagues were, quote, tottering along like a woman with bound feet, end quote. Mao wanted faster results. In October 1955, Zhou was fully on board with this order from the top. Then, an amazing thing happened. By November 1956, just a year later, 96% of rural households in China had been collectivized. This was quite a transformation, as you can imagine. A whole podcast series in itself. But collectivized, China did successfully, as instructed by Mao himself. So if you ever wondered where Mao got this idea that he could just make these grandiose demands for economic results and make them happen, this is where that notion came from. By the successful conclusion of the five antes, not only had agricultural been transformed, but private industry as well. 80 to 90 percent of commerce and industry was under mostly government control. This was quite an achievement. Mao Zedong was a lot of things, but he was not an economist. Perhaps dizzy with success, he felt this same kind of single-mindedness and mobilization of the masses and all-out push for results could work in rapidly industrializing China. And so began the great leap forward. Zhou had been the one trying to push back against the Mao juggernaut that kept demanding an end to economic conservatism. That was the buzzword back in 1956-57. Mao was saying, drive faster, and economic conservatives, though they'll live to regret it later on, didn't listen and follow orders. And Zhou had been the most vocal in the party, opposing Mao on moving forward too rashly. Because of this, Zhou was going to be forced to go through one of those things again where if he said mea culpa 10,000 times, it wouldn't have been enough for Chairman Mao. And when people began to ask after Zhou Enlai passed away, why didn't he stop Chairman Mao from allowing the Cultural Revolution to happen? The events of 1958 maybe shed some light on that question. 1956, 57, whenever I hear those two years in the context of Chinese history, I always think of the Hundred Flowers and anti rightist movements. These two years were hardly calm years, but they were certainly the calm before the storm that would hit in 1958. Mind you, just before and during the Hundred Flowers and anti rightist campaigns, Joe was racking up the frequent flyer miles carrying his foreign minister briefcase while he was concurrently dealing with these profound party matters and Chairman Mao throwing down the gauntlet to everyone. His efforts were tireless in getting the PRC plugged in and networked with the rest of the world. But the Chairman Mao side of his job, up to the end, would always be Joe's highest priority. It was thought that maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea, given how horrible intellectuals had had it during the first five years of the PRC's history, if they were allowed to get some things off their chest. I'm not sure how enthusiastic Mao was, knowing his tolerance for criticism, but he went along with Joe on this. So, April 1956, Mao gives the whole let 100 flowers bloom and 100 schools of thought contend speech. People were starting to talk, but of course they're holding back from expressing their truest feelings. Meanwhile, Mao is feeling the heat. Khrushchev, secret speech, the Polish and Hungarian uprisings, and no one taking him seriously about his ideas for all-out mobilization of the masses to grow the economy. Joe had gone to Moscow shortly after Khrushchev's secret speech was made and went straight to the Soviet leader and basically said, hey, what the hell, man? He registered Mao's feelings about 
how easily Stalin had gotten thrown under the bus. In February 1957, Mao gave the official go-ahead for the Hundred Flowers campaign to roll out. And that is something he lived to regret. In three months, the torrent of vitriol being hurled at the party and at Mao and the leadership was alarming, to say the least. When the headline of the People's Daily read, Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, it's time for you to step down, Mao had to put an end to this great idea of Premier Zhou's. And so followed the anti rightist campaign. Mao put Deng Xiaoping in charge of this one. About 550,000 rightists got paid back for their honesty. Like with the Cultural Revolution that would follow a decade later, people's lives were ruined by either humiliation, death, and everything in between. Of these over half a million people affected by 1957's anti rightist campaign, Joe tried to save as many as he could. Under the circumstances, however, it wasn't easy. And like he did with the five aunties, he had to turn away when the victims were let out the back door. But still, in September 1957, at the Third Plenum, Mao began to make more noise than usual about his policies. He was fishing for the Great Leap Forward, was what he was trying to do. But too many leaders, led by Zhou Enlai, were pushing back and saying, slow the heck down. And all this while, the anti rightist campaign was at a full boil. So everyone was completely on edge, and no one dared predict who Mao was going to come down on next. And Zhou was working with Chen Yun, Bo Yibo, and Li Xianyan to work out the final details of the second five-year plan. They had considerably scaled down the ambitious plans that Mao had demanded. And Mao remained quiet for the time being, watching, listening. It had been more than a year since Khrushchev disposed of Stalin and his legacy. Now Mao was lying in wait to see who were his Khrushchevs. When Mao came back from the Soviet Union's 40th anniversary of the revolution in October 1957, he was thoroughly convinced the split was inevitable and coming soon. Sputnik had just happened on October 4th. The time had come to get out from behind Russia's shadow. This is where Zili Gengsheng was born. And for the sake of Zili Gengsheng, 20 to 40 million people will perish from starvation and neglect. Zili Gengsheng was what the North Koreans call Juche. It means self-reliance. Nobody helping you. Do it yourself. Mao truly thought, if you got everyone involved, anything could be overcome. Ren duo, hao ban shi. Zhou was now operating in a very difficult dynamic. He had pissed Chairman Mao off with all the blowback and embarrassment of the Hundred Flowers movement, and he was talking louder than anyone else in the party against Mao's economic directives and called them rash. So Mao used the extent of his dignitas and auctoritas and expanded the scope of the anti rightist campaign. Mao made it clear to all, if you opposed his economic policies and backed the conservatives, you too were now a rightist. And that was Chairman Mao's line in the sand. And those who thought Mao would come to his senses played that one dead wrong. And Mao showed everyone, most of all Zhou Enlai, who was in charge. There was a conference in Nanning, Guangxi Province, January 1958. Mao attacked Zhou, and Zhou backed down. And with that, lie the road to the Great Leap Forward. Well, no need to rehash the whole Great Leap Forward. Everything Zhou warned it would be, it was. 1958 was a difficult year for China's premier. The Nanning Conference, where Mao cowed Zhou and the CCP leadership, took place in January. By November, December 1958, after the country's well-being was put on the back burner and everyone got on board the Great Leap Forward train, the magnitude of the looming disaster first began to manifest itself. Before the truth became known, Joe had to go before all party leaders and say he was wrong and Mao was right. He had to take it again from Mao in Chengdu in March 1958. There he had to hang his head in shame while Mao castigated him. Joe made a string of self-criticisms throughout that year, one more sincere and contrite than the next. He just repeatedly fell on his sword to make the point that he was sorry 
for going against Mao and what ultimately became the Great Leap Forward. Chen Yun, Bo Yi Bo, Li Xianyan, those guys too. They were all Joe's accomplices in this matter. The coup de grace was Joe's self-criticism at the Eighth Party Congress. Once Joe stood before a thousand delegates and for the umpteenth time admitted his mistake in going against Mao's correct line, Mao was finally convinced Joe had learned his lesson. Furthermore, by giving it so hard to someone like Joe and Lai, Mao felt secure that the rest of the party leadership would fall into line. And this, of course, they did. By the way, in March 1958, while Joe was getting raked over the coals, he was carrying out the initial investigation into what would become the Three Gorges Dam project. That idea went back all the way to Joe in the, in the 50s. In February 1958, Joe handed off the foreign minister's position to Chen Yi. And that took a load off, I'm sure. These unofficial ties with the U.S. that Joe had set up in Geneva were temporarily cut from late 1957 into most of 1958. Yeah, 1957-58, and for sure 1959. Those were some rough waters at the upper echelons of the PRC. I know the Cultural Revolution always grabs the headlines as far as times of great chaos go, but the period from the anti-rightist movement in 1957 up through the Great Leap Forward, not a good time for many. And this extended to rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows. The government turned the entire population on these four pests. The Eurasian tree sparrow was almost, but not quite, driven to extinction between 1958 and 1962. Once this campaign against the sparrows came to its successful conclusion, the crop-eating insects of China's agricultural heartlands had their own Tang Dynasty. Well, Khrushchev came to Beijing in the summer of 1958, and he just went on and on about this whole crazy idea of Mao's. He minced no words and said China was heading up the creek without a paddle. The big picture problem for Zhou Enlai, as the summer of 1958 grew hotter and steamier, was that he and everyone else except Mao and his most devoted sycophants knew Khrushchev was right. This was, by all accounts, from very rational and informed people, a recipe for the makings of the biggest economic and human disaster in perhaps all of recent Chinese history, maybe even since ancient times. What was happening now was the setup to the horrific famine that was to follow, that these production figures and rosy reports being sent up the totem pole all the way to Mao were all a sham and was now common knowledge. The one thing that everyone was thinking, end of 1958, was that, hmm, looks like Premier Joe was right all along, and Mao was wrong. By November, it was evident that hard times were about to befall the PRC. Mao had to retreat slightly and think about how to spin this, no doubt. Liu Shaoqi, at this point, was made state chairman. This position doesn't exist anymore. Mao was still party chairman and CMC chairman. And those were the only two that mattered. As the year turned to 1959, Joe was still as busy as ever. I'm not sure how he felt. Vindicated. He was laying low and conducting himself very appropriately. I don't know how many meals Chairman Mao missed during the famine years, but Joe served as a model with respect to being in solidarity with the hungry masses the stories about the lengths that people went to, 1959, 60, 61 in China, to get by day by day, have been well documented. Like others, during those years, Zhou Enlai grew thin and he aged a great deal. On June 20th, 1959, Khrushchev backed out of the deal he made to provide China with nuclear weapons technology. Mao had never felt more uneasy on his throne than he did in the summer of 1959. Joe never uttered a word that was critical of Mao or his obvious bad idea gone awry. Others were talking, but the overall mood was to keep your mouth shut. Joe arrived at Lushan in Jiangxi province on July 2nd, 1959. What everyone thought the Lushan conference was going to be received a shocking lesson in how Chairman Mao operated. The prevailing opinion going into this meeting was that Mao was going to back down on the Great Leap. 
and make some kind of an admission that it wasn't such a good idea and maybe he might even accept the blame. After much quiet discussion, Peng Dehuai gave his famous private letter to Chairman Mao on July 14th. Mao read it to everyone a few days later. Mao knew Peng didn't write it himself and that a man of Peng's sophistication surely had help in writing this critical letter. Mao knew what everyone was thinking. Once the topic was up for discussion, Mao at first came in for a high degree of criticism. The mistakes were obvious. They were picked up and waved in front of Mao's face. Zhou Enlai, however, continued his silence and didn't join in as other comrades piled on Mao. When everyone was finished having their fun, Mao had his turn to speak. First off, he apologized to Zhou for criticizing him like he did. Then Mao went on the attack. As we all know from many past CHP episodes, Mao turned on Peng De Huai and drove the political sword in deep. Then anyone who sympathized with or supported Peng got it next. The message of the Lu Shan Conference was as clear as a bell. Those who deviated from Mao's line had to pay a price. And pretty much from this Lu Shan conference in the summer of 1959 until 17 years later when Mao died in 1976, any criticism of Mao was criticism of the party. No one would ever again dare to make the mistake of Peng De Huai. And the fury with which Mao came down on Peng was so filled with rage, everyone ran for cover. And into the 8th plenum of the 8th Central Committee, Mao kept beating this drum nice and loud. Then, one by one, Zhou Enlai most notably and most critically, all of Peng De Huai's comrades, going back to even before the Long March, came in to drive their sword into their old comrade. From that point forward, it was not permitted to go against Mao. And Mao rewarded Zhou for not going against him at Lu Shan. And perhaps it was this lesson in history that Zhou remembered when Mao launched the Cultural Revolution six years later. Even someone with Zhou Enlai's stature and abilities, it wasn't so easy nor so simple to bring down someone the size of Mao Zedong. Now that Mao had made things clear at Lu Shan in the hot summer of 1959, everyone knew how to conduct themselves moving forward. Throughout 1959 and into 1960, Zhou had to manage China's comeback from the brink. By July of 1960, the Sino-Soviet split will happen, and four months after that, John F. Kennedy defeated Richard M. Nixon in one of the closest U.S. elections in history. Zhou had his hands full, as always, dealing with the magnitude of China's various crises. Emergency austerity measures were put in place to allow the country to make it through the worst of times. Once Mao gave the okay in 1960 to retreat from all this madness, Zhou Enlai rushed in to spearhead the efforts to put the house back in order the way it was in 1955-56. This included the rehabilitation of 40,000 intellectuals who had been caught up in the anti-rightist dragnet. Twenty years later, someone asked Deng Xiaoping about Mao's disastrous decisions. Deng replied, quote, We all bear responsibility for what happened. Mao was hot-headed, but what about all of us? We did not oppose him. We went along with him. End quote. That's what Zhou Enlai did with the Great Leap Forward, and as we'll see, did the same thing when the Cultural Revolution came along. Everyone talks about challenging their boss or telling their boss off. Yeah, it's easy to do when he's not around. But when you're face-to-face, -face, most do what Zhou Enlai did. Keep your mouth shut. This is a nice, convenient spot to slide that bookmark back in. We'll pick up next time in Part 7 with the aftermath of The Great Leap and all the drama that followed. Until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from sunny and gorgeous Los Angeles, California. 88 degrees, ladies and gentlemen. That's 31 Celsius, whole rest of the world. More Joe and Lie to come. Stick with the program and consider joining me next time, won't you? Perhaps? for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.